I'll jump in. Um, we're really excited to have um, Jeff with us here um, today. You know, Jeff is a, a director of BYU Publications and um, Graphics. He's been leading a team, really designing and, and helping design, I think, BYU's brand and then helping do that. Um, you know, he, again, he's also been the editor of um, the BYU magazine and some of the other magazines as, as well. Um, and he's re we're really excited to have him here today and to join us um, to really talk about what really goes into developing a brand and what we can learn from that. And I know Jeff's been, you know, spoken on this many times, spoken to other people as well and at BYU devotionals. And so we're really, really excited to have him um, here. He has, a, you know, degrees from journalism from BYU and Northwestern um, and has a family. Uh, his wife and has two daughters. So we're again really excited, um, Jeff, to, to hear from you today and we'll turn the time over to you. Um, people that have questions, they can submit those in chat and Matt will manage that as well when we get done. We'll probably unlock and if people can talk, sounds like we're having a hard time getting other, other people to talk on video, but um, Jeff will take some time and then answer some questions. So turn the time over to Jeff. Great, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm grateful to be here through the wonders of technology, even as challenging as they may be at times, but thank you for for allowing me to be a part of your group for a few minutes today. Um, I'm, I'm grateful for the the experiences I've had at BYU for over many, many years in, in many different ways. And particularly in the last several years, we've been, we've been working on this branding project. Um, and thank you for, for that introduction, Gary. Um, uh, my family, most important part of who I am, there we are yesterday, we went up by Aspen Grove to get a family picture. It was a little bit chilly up there, but love my family and grateful for them. One of the things that perhaps I, am, I might be most famous for is that my daughter and I, I think, are probably the only people who have ever played the BYU fight song on bagpipes. Um, we did that this summer during quarantine. We we did a little um, music video of us playing around our home. We called it "The World Is Our Campus," and we recreated campus scenes around our house. So that was that was kind of fun. So there you go. The the the, the most famous thing I've ever done. <laughs> um, so I, I want to share today some some lessons I've learned from branding. As as was mentioned in my introduction, I'm a journalist by training, and and I was the editor of BYU Magazine for 15 some odd years. And then about seven or eight years ago, I got this job as director of publications and graphics. And I knew that branding would be part of my uh, job, but I didn't know anything about it. Um, so uh, I've, I've learned a lot over the last seven or eight years about branding. I, I don't consider myself an expert, but I have learned a lot of really helpful things. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing with you seven lessons that I've learned about branding through this process. And, and I hope that these are helpful for you as well. I know many of you have, have vast experience in marketing and branding, and, and some of this may be repeat for you, but hopefully there's something new for you um, as well through all this. Um, we got started in this process from the visual identity standpoint. Our office, we have a, a staff of about 20 designers, writers, editors, and, uh, and we are responsible for the university's visual identity. And you might look at our visual identity landscape and think we haven't been doing a very good job, and, and you'd be right. Um, we have not really managed BYU's visual identity well for the last many years. And so several years ago, we decided we need to try to wrangle this into some sort of logical coherence. Um, but this is what we're dealing with. Um, there's a lot of different ways of treating the BYU identity across campus. So we started a few years ago trying to bring some sense and some order to all this to create some guidelines that would be coherent and accepted across campus. And we spent a few years on that and we had a really hard time getting traction and making headway. We came up with some guidelines that we thought were really good, um, but we had a hard time getting buy-in on those. And we realized a couple of years ago why. And, and that was that we, like our good friend Admiral Akbar, had fallen into a trap. You might remember him from Star Wars. Um, and the trap, it's a very common trap with branding. And the trap is this, that branding does not equal a logo. And branding is so much bigger than logos. And, and so that's the first part of branding lesson one. Um, branding isn't a logo. And, and we had fallen into that trap because we'd said, let's tackle that logo issue without dealing with the bigger brand issue. And so we'd, we'd done that and, and we realized a couple of years ago, we needed to change that. So let's talk a little bit about what branding really is. And, and again, when I started this job, I didn't know anything. And so I went to the, the Marriott School and 
found a professor in the Tanner building of, of marketing. And I said, can you teach me about branding? And we sat down in, in a classroom in the Tanner building for an hour or so. And he gave me a very basic overview of branding, which was really helpful for me. And for me, it was surprising. And, and maybe some of these things aren't surprising to you, but they were for me um, starting out. And, and the, one of the first things he said is he asked this question. He said, who owns your brand? And I thought, well, that's an interesting question. But the, the answer surprised me. The answer was not you. <laughs> you do not own your brand. Um, and then he said this, he said that your brand lives in the hearts and minds of your audiences. They own your brand. Um, we don't own our brand. We don't control our brand. We don't dictate our brand, but we can influence it. Another way to think about this little simple graphic thing is, is that our audiences own the brand position in their hearts and minds. What they believe about us is our brand. Um, what we own is our brand positioning and brand positioning is our efforts to influence the brand position. It's how we try to, to affect what people think and feel about BYU in this case. But it's important to remember we're not the only people influencing their perception. We have official communications that come out from BYU and we try to influence how people feel about the university. But there are lots of other brand influences or influencers. You all experience this. Uh, speaking of BYU in particular, um, we official communicators at BYU aren't the only interactions you have with BYU. You interact with BYU students, with other alumni, with um, uh, with performers who come from BYU to your area or athletes you see on TV uh, or your own interactions with uh, through your classes with professors and, and other things that you've had. All of these experiences influence your perception of the BYU brand, the news media. Things you read in the news media influences your perception of the brand. And all of these different influences may be giving you different messages about the brand represented by those different colors. All of those messages start to influence your thoughts and feelings about the BYU brand, and then you act in relation to the brand according to how you feel. And your actions back to BYU may not be what we want them to be. You may be coming back with brown when we want you to be navy, right? Um, so so that, that illustrates the challenge of branding, that we don't own or, or are the sole influence on our brand. Now, ideally, and we hope to get to this point where all of those brand influences are saying the same thing. And once you do that, then the audience reflects back what you want them to reflect. And at that point, you'd get to where what you say is brand value, where there is consistency in the brand messaging and, and the audience member believes what you want them to believe. And, and there's this reciprocal relationship that's really valuable for a brand. That's where we'd hope to be. None of us are probably really there <clears throat> because there are all, of all these influences we can't really control. But perhaps that illustrates a little bit what, what we mean when we say we don't own our brand. Um, another way of, of illustrating these different influences on a brand is, is a little story. Um, a few years ago, I was on the board for um, a professional association in the Western region. And, uh, and there was another member for, of the board from BYU. And we had the opportunity to host the board at BYU for um, meetings, for three days of meetings. And so we picked them up at the Salt Lake Airport and we took them to the Roof Restaurant in Salt Lake City. And if you've been there, you know it's really great food and it's a buffet and it's a buffet unlike anything you may have had before. It's really, really good food. And, and especially at the end, they, they have this dessert buffet that is just fantastic. Um, really good food, and, and I recognize this is rice before lunch, and I'm sorry to tempt you there, but but really a great dessert buffet, and they enjoyed their time there, and and then we brought them down to campus, and the next day we brought them into a room for some meetings, and, and at everybody's place in that room, we gave them a bag of BYU Cougar Crunch, which is a wonderful caramel um, popcorn that we make on campus. For lunch that day, we took them to the Sky Room and, and they enjoyed the restaurant there, which is also a really nice buffet. And they also have a great spread of dessert. And many of them had to sample BYU ice cream, which they really enjoyed. Um, and at the end of our meetings, we sent them home with a box of BYU fudge. So we, we gave them no alcohol and no coffee during their time. But boy, did we pump them full of sugar in those three days. And and at the end, as I was driving people back to Salt Lake, um, one of them made a comment and I realized that we had unwittingly created an expectation 
she said, BYU really knows how to do sugar. And, and she said, well, it illustrated that, that we'd created an, an expectation there. Um, you might call it a brand promise that BYU equals sugar. Now, this is a lighthearted, simple example, but it illustrates how a brand is influenced by all these different interactions we have. And sometimes we unwittingly create a brand expectation. We didn't go into this series of meetings thinking we want people to know that BYU's got really great desserts. But we came away with that impression. Um, what we did want is we wanted them to know that BYU treats people well and that we host people well. And so we gave them lots of desserts because that's one way we do that, right, in our culture. Um, but, but we created this um, unexpected um, brand promise. So again, illustrating there's a lot of different ways that we influence a brand, sometimes intentionally and sometimes not. So we've talked a bit around this question, but how do you define a brand simply? It's a difficult thing to do. Um, you might have heard of David Ogilvy, the father of modern advertising. He said a brand is the intangible sum of a product's attributes. Um, that's a, a helpful definition. It's a little bit maybe nebulous still, but but this idea, it's 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 a sum of a lot of different things. <clears throat> Marty Neumeyer is a, a writer about branding and marketing, and he talked about branding being a person's gut feeling about a product, service, or organization. <clears throat> Excuse me. These are helpful, so helpful definitions. Um, one way that I like to talk about branding um, that may be overly simplistic, but it, but people understand it, and I, I think it, it's a helpful way. And this is the second part of branding lesson number one, and that is that a brand is your reputation. It's what your audience thinks and believes and feels about you based on all their interactions with you. Um, with your customer service people, with your product, with your marketing, uh, all of these things influence your reputation. And so branding is, in one sense, it's your reputation. <clears throat> branding lesson number two. This came um, a couple of years ago. We met with um, someone from the church. Um, you may or may not know the church has been engaged for the last 15 or so years in a pretty aggressive brand exercise. And they did a really major research project. It involved focus groups and quantitative studies worldwide. Um, and we met with one of the people responsible for that. And it was very impressive to hear about what they've done. And I wanted to share just a little bit of what we learned from that um, exercise. First is, is the priority the church is placing on it, that it's really important for the church to understand and communicate their brand effectively. This is the visual style guide that the church has created. And, and you recognize here on the left side of this publication, those, that light rays motif. And you will have seen that in church publications in recent years, in church videos. They're using it a lot and they're using it really effectively, I think. Um, so th that's one way they're doing it. But, but this is their visual style guide. And on, I think this is maybe page two or three, you, you see um, that they really are understanding brand in this um, description on the right. Um, they say that, that we have opportunities to influence the perceptions of the church through visuals, style, words, messages, culture, and experiences. Again, that brand is so much more than just the visuals. It involves all of these things. This culture we create creates our brand. And as you go throughout the visual style guide, you come to a list of attributes. And these are attributes that they came to based on all of their research. And uh, I'll go through these kind of quickly, but just so you can get a sense for how the church is approaching branding. Um, and you might recognize that some of these themes have become more common in messaging lately from the church, in conference talks and in other things, you might have seen some of this. So um, attribute number one is welcoming. Number two, empathetic. Global. straightforward, authentic and honest, positive, humble, and motivating. Now, if you were to sit down and make a list of the attributes of the church, you might come up with a different list, but this is what they came up with from their research. Um, these are the things that people resonated with that seemed important to people as they interact with the church. Um, 
and and so that was interesting for us to see how the church is approaching branding um, and this illustrates that next lesson which is that um, you should try to identify key attributes as we seek to influence the reputation of our brand we need to first understand what it is ourselves what are the attributes of our brand that we're trying to communicate um, what attributes are important for us to communicate what attributes do people already believe about us um, so that was a key effort in our own branding effort at BYU. Um, we engaged, so a couple of years ago, we uh, proposed to the administration that we do a broader brand study. We said this visual identity thing is important, but we're not getting the traction we need because we haven't dealt with the deeper brand. So we really need to address the deeper brand issues. And they approved and gave us funding. And so we've engaged a consulting firm and we've gone through a really extensive research process over the last year, um, year plus. Um, and I'm going to share a little bit of that with you. But we, our consultants came to campus last September and spent three days on campus in about 30 different discussion groups with, with students, alumni, faculty, staff, different groups of those um, audiences, as well as community members, community leaders, um, administrators on campus. Um, they also conducted individual interviews with members, with leaders of the church, with leaders of other universities, with um, athletic associations, employment recruiters, alumni leaders, all sorts of different people, all trying to determine how do we talk about ourselves as a brand. And part of the goal of that was to identify those attributes. What are the attributes that are important to BYU? So in those meetings on campus, that's what they were trying to do. They were trying to say, what what, when we talk about ourselves, what attributes do we use? Um, and so from that, they came up with 16 attributes that seemed important to how we talk about ourselves as a university. Well, we followed that process up with um, a series of, of quantitative surveys. Um, we surveyed uh, prospective students, students, alumni, faculty, staff, um, church members who are not affiliated with um, BYU, um, and members of the general public who are not affiliated with either the church or BYU, um, also employment recruiters. So really extensive survey, lots of different audiences and hundreds to thousands of people in each of those audiences responding. Um, we wanted to be really exhaustive as, as, we, as much as we could in this process. So in those surveys, we were asked a lot of different questions, but a key question was about those 16 attributes, two questions actually. Um, <clears throat> so the first question we asked about each of those attributes was, how important is this attribute for a world-class university? We wanted to understand, as someone evaluates universities, and they look at BYU versus, say, Notre Dame, how do they evaluate those universities? So what, what is a world-class university in their mind? And what are they looking for in a world-class university? The second question we asked is how much do you associate this attribute with BYU? So we wanted to get a measure of what do they believe about us already? So here are the 16 attributes, um, and I'll, I won't read them all, I'll let you digest them a little bit here. <clears throat> but they're listed here in order of their importance, again, to a world-class university. Um, and that's important to recognize again, we weren't asking how important is this to BYU, and because of that, you might notice the faith is quite low. Number 13 and 14 are two different faith measures there. Um, we're quite low because we're asking about a world-class university. If we asked about BYU, it might be different. Um, surprising to me was number one and two. Um, number one of importance was the development of a high moral character. And this is across all audiences. So this includes um, all those different audiences we surveyed. This is the average among all participants in the survey. If you look at each audience, you might see, you would see different patterns. Um, uh, the number two there, candid dialogue about difficult issues, was really important among our internal audiences, um, students, alumni, faculty, staff, um, that was high for them. However, the members of the general public, it was not quite so important for them, which was interesting to us. Um, academic rigor, also important, and you can see, see the others there. Um, this next column shows the, um, the scores. So it was a five-point scale, and you can see here the average score across all audiences. Um, on a five-point scale, anything above a four is considered a strong score. So one of the first things you see is that 12 of the 16 attributes were seen as being very important to a world-class university. And you can see those scores there. 
Um, the next column that I'm going to add here shows um, their association of these attributes with BYU on that same five-point scale. We've also added on the attributes list, we've added in parentheses a number. That is the rank of association with BYU. So the top six, really it's the top five, but there was a tie at number five. The top six associated with BYU are in bold and blue there. So number one, academic rigor. Number two, experiential learning. Number three, learning by study and by faith. Four, global mindset. Five, a tie between contributing to the community and developing faith. So those are the top six things that people associate with BYU from this attributes list. Um, some other things to note here as you look at this list. Again, anything above a four is strong. And I think in this case that there's 11 of the 16 that are above a four associated with BYU. So in general, this tells us that this list is a good list, that, that these are important to our audience. Many of these things are very important to our audiences and they're associated with BYU. Um, also, as you look at some specifics, some interesting things to note, the number one of importance, development of a high moral character, is the number seven associated with BYU, so just outside of that bold list. Um, its score is a 4.64 for importance, a very strong score, and 4.35 for BYU, which is also a very strong score. So that suggests that that's something we can use in our branding. People believe that about us. They believe it's important. That's a strength that we can build on. The next one, also very interesting, candid dialogue, very important, not very associated with BYU. So that illustrates a potential concern. And this next column then illustrates that as well, where we look at the gaps um, between the importance and the BYU score. And here you can see that the bold are statistically significant, red being negative, green being positive. And, and so this starts to illustrate some patterns that we can use in our branding. <clears throat> we'll come back to some of this. Uh, but from all of this data and, and the research, other research that we've done over the last year or so, we started to develop um, messages. And, you know, the church chose to, to select eight attributes. We've decided to develop five messages, a little bit different take on it. But that's kind of what our consulting firm recommended. And, and it allows us to combine attributes in some ways that we think are helpful. Um, now, these messages are still in draft form. So I'm sharing with you a draft. <laughs> so don't don't publicize this because this is still not final, but but we, we have created this in draft form and we have shared it um, in in some uh, testing. In the last couple of months, we've done some focus group testing with students, faculty, staff, and alumni um, to see, do these resonate? Do these messages resonate with you? And actually, right after this meeting, I'm going to be meeting with our consultants and they're going to share with us the results of that testing and they're gonna recommend some changes. So these, these will change, <laughs> but these are the draft messages, <clears throat> the five messages that we've created to represent BYU's brand. And as you look through these, the, you'll see messages related, the first one is related to our educational outcomes, that our, that our education is for the benefit of the world um, and that we expect our students to go out and serve the world. Uh, the second one's related to our faculty, who they are, the third one is kind of our overall brand message, perhaps. Um, the fourth um, is connected to the student experience. What is the student experience like? And then the fifth one is sort of our celebration message. We're gonna be coming up on our 150th anniversary in just five years. So um, there's a lot to celebrate about BYU and, and the influence that the university has um, across the world. So this gives you a sense of how we're trying to grapple with this, this idea of attributes and, and what are our brand attributes. Um, as you think about your personal brand and, and other brands that you associate with, this is a really helpful exercise to think about attributes and to ask people about attributes. You might remember in a general conference um, in October in the Saturday morning session, Elder Whiting talked about attributes and, and the attributes that we can develop. And he, he brought this very issue up. He said, you might consider asking someone about what attributes they think are important to you. Um, that sometimes we see ourselves with a skewed perspective, but friends and family can help us see ourselves more accurately. Um, but even they might be skewed. So it's helpful to ask God to help us understand what attributes we need to develop in our own lives. So that's a, a helpful part of our brand personally as well as professionally. Um, as you think about this exercise, here's some questions you might think about asking. Um, you can first ask yourself, what are my attributes? What should my attributes be? Um, but you can also ask other people, what attributes do they identify with you? 
what attributes they identify most strongly and what attributes don't they identify strongly with you? What attributes do they think are most important for you? Another way of looking at this would be to consider what are your spiritual gifts? I was in a meeting recently where someone talked about uh, spiritual gifts and he said that he'd heard a patriarch say, sometimes we look at our patriarchal blessings and we see these spiritual gifts and we think this is just an endowment that we're given. Um, but he said, you might want to think about that as an invitation of something you can develop, that your spiritual gifts are attributes that you have a propensity for, but you still need to develop them. That might also be some a helpful tool for you as you think about your attributes. Some of you may have participated in a, a 360 review where you get um, feedback on your performance professionally um, from uh, your supervisor, from your peers, from people you oversee, all these different people who are connected with you evaluating your, your performance. And one of the things that they often do in a 360 review is they look at your attributes and what attributes are you strong in and what are you weak in? And then they also evaluate what attributes do they think are most important for you to succeed? That can be a really helpful exercise for you professionally as well as personally to, to evaluate those attributes. So moving on, branding lesson number three. This one um, has a couple of different elements to it, which are quite interesting. And, and this came up in a, a session I had this summer with a marketing professor. I was in a group and he, he shared some things with us about the an airline industry example that I thought were really quite insightful. Um, and this is fictional and I've adjusted these just to help illustrate the point. But um, if you were looking at the airline industry, you might identify several different attributes that customers use to evaluate um, the options in the airline industry. You might consider these attributes. There, there are probably others, but safety, price, reliability, service, convenience, comfort. Those, those all might be attributes you're evaluating when you choose your airline. This would represent then a customer service or a customer survey about the industry and how you each airline performs in these different categories. Now, let's say you represent airline A and you get these results. You might be tempted, as many of us are, to, to zero in on this side of the scale and say, oh, we are getting killed on convenience and comfort. We just are not performing well there. Um, and that's that's an important recognition in, in any time you do this sort of a survey, right? But your, your competitors are much higher than you on both of those measures. So if you decide you want to grapple with that in a world of finite resources, you might hate my might have to make some sacrifices. So if you try to increase convenience and comfort, you might have to decrease your value on price. In other words, it raise your prices, right? So you can afford more convenience and comfort. Um, and so you might feel pretty good about yourself at this point. All of your scores now are above a seven. You're feeling like you're performing pretty well. However, at the same time, your competitors might be doing the same thing. And they might be seeing where they're low and they try to bring that up. And if they do, what happens? Well, now everybody's pretty good and there's no differentiation. You're all the same. And so he's, he, this marketing professor said, if you really want differentiation, you need to approach it differently. So going back to the original scores, instead of focusing on those weaknesses, you focus on those strengths. Find where you're strong and emphasize those strengths and that can differentiate you from your competition. So in this example, you might say, we're really good on price and service convenience and comfort not so much and maybe our audience doesn't care so much about that maybe we've got the people who really want the cheap flight and want decent service and they don't care if their seats aren't so big and they don't have in-flight movies and if if they we don't go to every airport um and so maybe you de-emphasize those a little bit more and put more effort behind service and price to um, further differentiate yourself in the marketplace now that may not be the right approach but that's that's an interesting concept to think about of emphasizing your strengths to differentiate yourself in brand. So that's that's this next lesson is build on your strengths. Now, from BYU's perspective, as we look at all those attributes that we've talked about, um, we've started to identify some themes that are coming up. And you've I've kind of given away the, the show by sharing the attributes with you, but or the messages. But but here's some of the strengths that we've observed. Um, and these first two are things that are not a surprise to you. We talk about ourselves in these ways all the time. Um, but as we look at that attributes list, um, we th think there are seven attributes that are related to by study and by faith and seven different attributes related to enter to learn, go forth to serve. 
And you average those scores and you can see those are, are really strong messages for us. They're very important to our audiences. They're very strongly associated with BYU. These are, are valuable things we can use in our communications about ourselves. Um, the, you know, it's interesting, BYU has uh, a lot of logos, as we've talked about already. We also have a lot of mottos, right? We have enter to learn, go forth to serve. We have the world is our campus, the glory of God is intelligence, um, the quest for perfection, um, all of these different ways of describing who we are. And so in addition to testing logos, we wanted to test mottos. And so we asked about these different mottos. And it was interesting that clearly um, above all the others, enter to learn, go forth to serve resonates with our audiences as being how we feel about ourselves, that we come to this campus to learn, and then we have an obligation to go out and serve um, and to share what we've learned. So that is a key message for us in our branding. These are strengths we can use to differentiate ourselves from other universities. This next strength was, was a surprise to me, but I think it illustrates a really helpful thing. Um, and and that it, this came up in the discussion groups last fall, and it came from deans who were saying, we have a lot of young faculty who are enthusiastic and eager to collaborate on research with, with peers, with industry. Um, and, and this also comes up through President Worthen's inspiring learning emphasis you may have heard about, where he is encouraging students and faculty to provide hands-on learning opportunities for students of being involved in research, of having study abroad, service opportunities, um, internships, all these kind of things that, that help students augment their education through real, real world application that helps them benefit their education as well as share their education, engaging with the world in meaningful ways. This, this, starts, this strength here starts to illustrate um, that BYU is not perhaps some aloof ivory tower, but BYU is trying to actively pursue education and truth for the betterment of the world that we believe that what we can offer can help the world be a better place. That's an important part of our brand. It's a strength to our brand. As you see, attributes related to that also score very strongly for us. So that's something we can use as we talk about BYU um, in our communications to differentiate ourselves. On the personal development side, you might, again, going to um, the 360 degrees uh, surveys, these are done by, I'm sure other groups do them as well, but Zanger Folkman, you may have heard of as a leadership consulting firm that conducts these 360 reviews um, where you get that feedback. Um, and they have a, a book and a, a series called The Ex Extraordinary Leader, Leader, some training that they do and, and an emphasis of their 360 review is how to make you an extraordinary leader. Um, and some of you may be familiar with this, but but they have a system that they look at and they've evaluated through all their research um, what leads to leadership effectiveness. And they've studied people who have fatal flaws, which are you know really serious flaws. And um, we all have weaknesses, but there's some flaws that are fatal, right? Um, people have fatal flaws and no strengths. Those who don't have any fatal flaws, but they don't also have any really significant strengths. And then people who have one or two profound strengths and no fatal flaws, and, and they look at their performance. And obviously, um, emphasizing those profound strengths can be really, really important. And they found that having um, decent performance across many things and, and getting rid of your strengths um, is less important for making you a profound leader than emphasizing a few strengths. If you can identify a couple of things that you're strong in and build those into profound strengths, instead of focusing on your weaknesses, you can focus on those strengths and you can become a really effective leader. Um, so effective leaders don't always deal with their weaknesses. They do if it's a fatal flaw, but not necessarily other weaknesses. They focus on their strengths and build on those. Anyway, a helpful thing to think about as we think about our personal brands, as well as our organizational brands, that emphasizing those strengths can help differentiate us and help us be really effective. As we look at um, branding lesson number four, this is sort of related. In Zanger Folkman, they talk about fatal flaws, and it's important to recognize that there are fatal flaws that have to be reckoned with. And if you don't reckon with those fatal flaws, then all your emphasis on strengths isn't going to do anything for you. Um, and so, so it, in our case at BYU, we're looking at our branding, and you might have recognized as you looked at those gaps, there were some pretty big negative gaps. Um, and there's a question as to whether these are fatal flaws. That's an objective, a subjective question. 
Um, um, but they're pretty significant flaws that we might need to address. Um, and these came up a lot in our campus discussions last fall and very revealing and, and insightful for us. Um, the first one, candid dialogue, that came up a lot from students. And it came up in, a, in an interesting sense in that many students would say, we recognize that the university is making improvements in this area. There is more candid dialogue happening on campus with greater frequency. And students would say, we really, we recognize that and we really appreciate that, but we need a lot more of that. And, and so there is this hunger for more open dialogue on campus. Inclusivity and diversity are very similar. Um, a, a strong desire across campus, students, alumni, faculty, staff, everybody recognizing that we do not have enough diversity on campus and we need more of that. Um, there's also a strong desire to be seen as inclusive. Um, it, it's important to us to be seen as inclusive. It, we feel it's part of our doctrine to be welcoming and loving and inclusive. And we want the world to know that about us, but we recognize that we're not there yet and, and that people don't know that about us. So there is a hunger for this change on campus on, on these issues. Um, it was interesting to note on, on all three of these issues that internal audiences, those who know us best, were more critical of us than were external audiences. Now, I was uh, presenting about this to a group on campus a couple of weeks ago, and as we were discussing those messages, those five messages that I shared with you earlier, um, somebody said, now, shouldn't there be something about candid dialogue and diversity in those messages? Those are, those are key weaknesses for us. Shouldn't we be addressing that in our brand messaging? And that's a really important point, and we do need to think of how to address those. But this starts to illustrate an interesting challenge with branding. If we at BYU went out tomorrow with a messaging campaign that BYU is diverse, how would people respond? Well, of course, they know we're not. And so they would see it as, as false advertising, right? It would not be authentic to them. And so that, that illustrates this next lesson that authenticity is really important in your branding. You can't say you are one thing if people don't believe that about you. They, they will see right through that, see it as in, inauthentic, and, and you lose credibility, right? So sometimes the change that needs to happen isn't necessarily in your branding. It might be in your, your patterns of action, right? And as you may know, um, President Worthen inaugurated probably about six months ago, a committee on race, equity, and belonging to address these kind of issues on campus. And this committee is just about done with its work. Our office has been asked to edit the, the final report. Um, and we expect that to be done in the next month or two. Um, and those findings should be start should start to be shared. Um, what this research to me suggests is that the work of that committee is going to be really well received because there is a hunger for this kind of change. And so um, hopefully these recommendations will really help us start to address these issues. So again, this lesson, brand lesson, is that authenticity is so important um, in a brand. And you might also think about this as brand integrity, um, that, that your integrity of who you are as an organization is critical for success. Um, one, there are a lot of definitions for integrity, but one might be that integrity is the harmony of word and action. That those two being aligned is, is really important. Sometimes as we look at our brand personally or professionally, we might see a need to change our actions to match our words. Or we might see a need to change our words to match our actions. And sometimes we might see a need to change both to match a goal. And that might be where BYU is on the, on the diversity question, that we might need to change what we do and how we talk about ourselves to accomplish this really important objective. And I, and I think you see some of that in, in the, the campus conversations that are happening these days. Um, another illustration of this authenticity thing uh, is an, an interesting insight. This is Arthur Brooks. You might have heard of him. He's a um, sort of a, a thought leader, um, a writer, um, a speaker. Uh, he received an honorary doctorate at BYU a year and a half ago and spoke at commencement. And this is just a, a short snippet of his speech. He tells this story that we've shared in BYU Magazine, actually, that uh, we call, he calls the, the magic briefcase story. It's really a, a great little story that illustrates some important things about branding. And I'll let him tell it in his own words here. Several years ago, I came to this beautiful place to BYU to deliver lecture. 
my wonderful host sent me home with a, a ton of branded souvenirs, T-shirts, mugs, you name it. You guys are great at product placement. <laughs> One particularly nice gift that I got that day was a briefcase, and it had BYU emblazoned across the front. Now, as it happened, I actually needed a new briefcase, but I kind of hesitated to use it because of the logo. It felt a little weird, like false advertising. See, I'm not a member of the faculty of BYU, nor am I a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm a Catholic. Somebody told me, by the way, that I'm your favorite Catholic, but I figure you say that to all the Catholics, so. <laughs> anyway, my wife, Esther, when, when I expressed this hesitance, she said, you know, that's ridiculous. She said, use the briefcase, it's beautiful. Okay, so I loaded it up, I took it out on the road. I travel all the time, I'm in airports constantly. And here's the weird thing. I noticed that people would look at my briefcase and then they'd look up at me. And they'd have this weird look on their face, like I've never seen an aging hipster Mormon before. <laughs> Excuse me, Latter-day Saint. <laughs> That gave me some amusement, but, but here's the funny part. I found that it was changing my behavior. I was acting with greater love and kindness than I ordinarily would. People would look at my briefcase and I'd say, I want to help with their luggage. <laughs> I want to give up my place in line, that sort of thing. Why? Because I was unconsciously trying to live up to the high standards of kindness of your church and your university. At the very least, not to hurt your well-earned reputation for kindness. You know what I else? I, I even stopped carrying cups of coffee. <laughs> uh, look, I love coffee, but, but I didn't want people to think that a member of your church is a hypocrite. I had this paranoid fantasy, you know? Like I, I, some guy telling his wife, you know, I saw this Mormon guy in O'Hare Airport ordering a venti latte at Starbucks. You know, I knew they were hypocrites. I didn't want that. And you know what? That briefcase made me a happier person, a more loving person. I was like the person I wanted to be. Why? Because I was trying to be like, like you. I think that's just a, a really great story. Um, and it illustrates a lot of different elements of branding, but especially this idea of authenticity that he felt the need to change his behavior to be authentic to the brand he was carrying. So branding lesson number five, and for this, we're going to go back to where we started in our process of branding, that the visual identity at BYU is a little bit confusing. And uh, if you just look at the different ways of treating the letters BYU here, we have such a variety. Um, and then you look at colors and other typefaces and, and um, graphic elements, and there's just so much confusion here, which illustrates this, this lesson, which is Branding should be simple and consistent. And right now, visually at BYU, we're not simple and consistent. And that is something that we really need to change, but we have to deal with this deeper brand as well. And, and this has broad implications as you think about simplicity and consistency. Um, to illustrate that, here are um, some slogans of a few key brands and see if you recognize what brands these are associated with. Now, I'm guessing that most of you could pretty quickly identify that those are related to Geico and BMW and Nike. Um, and why do you recognize that? Because they are simple and they are consistent. They beat that drum over and over and over again. How many times have we heard just do it? Or 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance um, or the ultimate driving machine. We hear that all the time. They are simple, they are consistent, they are repetitive. Um, they beat that drum. And, and it gets into our heads and we recognize it. Um, this illustrates an interesting challenge that we have and that we've discovered through our process at BYU and that is our focus on undergraduate students. Um, we are an undergraduate education institution and we do have graduate students but much smaller percentage of our population than the undergraduate students. Um, and that's an important part of who we are and that is a strategic decision. Um, however, <clears throat> as you look at our attributes list, 
You'll notice that undergraduate student focus is number 15 in importance out of 16 and number 12 in association with BYU. This illustrates that perhaps we are not communicating about this as well as we should. Perhaps we're not being as simple and consistent in our communication on this point. We haven't um, helped people understand that, yes, this is who we are, and this is why it matters to us. And we need to do some education on people that this is an important part of our brand for these reasons. So in, in this effort to build consistency, repetition is your friend. Repetition brings recognition, which brings familiarity, which brings affinity, which brings loyalty. And that's that's the process we want to bring our audiences through from, from just recognition to loyalty. That's where we want to get them to. Um, and so it takes repetition um, over and over and over again. President Eyring spoke about this a little bit when he <clears throat> talked about organizational and personal change. And he said, the best place to look um, for change is for small changes that we can make in things we do often. There is power and in steadiness and repetition. And we've all recognized that in our own personal lives in, in the power of small daily habits like prayer and scripture study. Um, those simple things that we do over and over and over again have real power in changing our lives, in changing our brands, our personalities, and how people perceive us. Branding lesson number six. Um, as we look at how we influence BYU's brand, um, we asked a question in our survey about how people became familiar with BYU. And you can see in this chart that there are a lot of ways that people become familiar with BYU. One of the things we've learned through this process is that we have a lot of opportunities to influence perceptions. We have so many outreach tools for BYU and, and it's unusual. Most universities don't have all that we have in terms of outreach um, and such broad outreach. Um, and you can see different things here that influence that. Social media data has shown us that arts content is shared very widely online. That's a really effective outreach tool for us. Obviously, as you look at the general public, the number one is athletics. That's the number one way they became aware of BYU. That's an effective tool for us. The news media is effective for that audience especially. Um, and then the one that I want to focus on here is that top one there. Knowing an alum of the university is the number one way that church members and employment partners become aware of BYU, and it's the number three for general public. So that is a key tool for us. In fact, it's look how high that is above the other percentages there. So you, um, many of you are BYU alumni, you are one of our most effective tools for educating people about the BYU brand. And, and the power of that personal interaction is, is so important, and we cannot overlook that. All the marketing we can do, all the effort we can spend on athletics and performing arts and news media, all those things can be effective. But that personal interaction with an alum of the, of the university is so important to um, our brand. So that's the lesson. Blinding lesson number six is personal interaction wins. It's, it's critical. It is so powerful. And this was illustrated by um, uh, an experience we had um, last November, a year ago. We had we conducted a general public focus group in Chicago. We brought together people who are not members of the church, not affiliated with the university in any way, and we wanted to learn how they perceive the university. So our consultants con conducted this, and I got to go and sit behind the glass and watch this um, conversation. It was really fascinating to see it develop. And at one point in the discussion, the, the tone of the conversation got kind of negative about BYU and the church. And all the old negative stereotypes came up about the church and they applied those to BYU and, and it was just really a negative tone. And in the midst of this, one woman in that group spoke up and she said, you know, wait a minute, this, this doesn't reflect my experience. And she told about a time when she'd been in Hawaii and she went to the Polynesian Cultural Center and while she was there, she interacted with some students and she called them BYU students. She didn't know they were BYU Hawaii students, but it, that BYU was what stuck with her. And she said she, she interacted with these BYU students and she had such a wonderful interaction that it completely changed her perception of BYU and of the church. And it affected her so profoundly that she felt to bring it up in this focus group years later and to defend BYU and to defend the church against the, this negativity in that room. And her bringing that up changed the tone of that conversation, illustrating the power of personal connection. 
this simple interaction she had with a couple of students in Hawaii had significant effect, effect on her perception of the brand as well as other people's perception as she shared that experience. Um, this quote has been attributed to many people, including Maya Angelou, but really it came from, from a general authority of the church um, back in the 50s or 60s. He said, they may forget what you said, but they will never forget how you made them feel. Branding is personal. It's how someone feels in their heart and mind about you. It's personal. And so those personal interactions have a huge impact on, on your brand. The final lesson um, to share today is, um, well, is this one. We asked a question and this revealed something that, that we all know. Um, and that is we asked, what is BYU best known for? Open-ended question. And you can see clearly the number one thing people know us for is our connection to the church. And the number four is that we're a religious school. So you add those two together and more than 40% said you're, you're a church school. Um, that is a huge part of our brand. And that tells us that of all the marketing efforts and things we can do to influence our brand, one of the biggest influences on our brand is the church. Um, it's one of those brand influencers that we don't have control over, right? Um, so the church is going to influence perceptions of BYU's brand. The flip side is also true that BYU is a key representative of the church brand and whatever BYU does is going to reflect on the church brand. So this branding lesson is an important one to remember and that is we need to consider our parent brands. As we think about our branding strategy, professionally, organizationally, personally, there are other brands that, so, that affect your own brand. Um, we are not a, a brand in isolation, but we have other brands that interact with us. In BYU's case, um, we have, as you know, a, a spectrum of educational institutions that all are connected to each other. We, many of us share the same name, all the different BYUs, right? Um, when we had our discussion groups on campus last fall, this issue came up a lot. And there was a lot of concern about confusion among the BYU brands. And so our consultant sat through three days of listening to this kind of discussion as well as other things. <clears throat> and at the end of their three days, we sat in a room with them and they kind of gave us their top of mind observations from their time with us. And one of them made a comment about this that I thought was really insightful. She said, you know, as a church, you actually have this really amazing story to tell about your commitment to higher education. If you're a member of your church graduating high school, you have this wonderful spectrum of opportunity available to you. Um, no matter your educational background or your educational goals, we have an opportunity for you. This is a great story for you to tell. One of the things we're learning through this process is we're probably not telling that story well enough. We need to understand what is the parent brand here? What are the shared attributes of these institutions that we can communicate about together? And then what are the differences? These institutions serve valuable and important differences. How can we articulate those in ways that help our audiences? So that is our opportunity to define the, both the parent brand and the unique strengths of each member of that brand family. Now, as you look at your own brand, you might think about your parent brands and you probably have a lot of them. Um, you're in your personal um, realm, you ha have family that are part of your parent brand um, or your children can be your parent brand in some ways. Um, the church can be a parent brand for you, BYU or whatever school you graduated from certainly has influence on your own personal brand. Your employer has influence. All of these groups have attributes in and of themselves that reflect upon you and you reflect upon them. So it's important to ask what will people assume about you because of what they know about your parent brands? And what will they assume about your parent brands because of their interactions with you? Just about done here, just a couple, two more slides. Um, this is uh, illustrated by a story you might recall from President George Albert Smith's life. When he was a young man, he was sick and, um, and had a dream. And in this dream, um, he saw his grandfather who he was named after. And his grandfather asked, what have you done with my name? I've always remembered that story from primary years ago. What a penetrating question. What have you done with my name? Uh, many of us have family names um, or um, other ways that we reflect someone else's name and we reflect on their brand. We also carry strengths from their brand. So at this Christmas time, we might think about, as, as we think about the Savior, we might think about this question. Um, we take his name upon us as members of the church um, by covenant. We take his name upon us. And so this has very direct branding application, right? What is his brand? And what does that say about us? 
and what do we say about his brand? So as we think about the seven lessons we've talked to today, just a couple quick thoughts here. Um, how do we benefit from his reputation by being associated with him? We can study his attributes. We can build his strengths into our own lives. We can be more authentic to his word. We can be more consistent in speaking about him and following him. We can be personal with others as he would. And we can remember that we represent him as our parent brand. I am grateful, and I'm sure you are as well, that I'm a part of his brand. Um, what benefits I gain in my life from that connection. Um, and then it's an important responsibility to remember how we represent him as well. So it's both a privilege and a responsibility to be a part of his brand, as it is with other parent brands that, that we're associated with. Anyway, that's, that's my presentation today. Thank you very much. Um, I hope that was helpful for you. Um, I hope we